Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us for our weekly show Dr. Satyajit Rath, and we are going to discuss various aspects of COVID-19. Is there any way of controlling the epidemic now in India? Why is it that we don't seem to see any falls in the numbers, unlike? almost all other countries which have had such a large number of in cases. Satyajit, looking at this issue, our numbers have been steadily rising. We don't see any fall or, you know, even in the new cases, we don't really see a dip in the cases. In the US, for instance, it has dipped twice. Of course, it's also gone up each time. Italy, there was a long dip before it rose again second wave as it is being called. But in India, we never saw any dip on, in the infections. It has been steadily going up in spite of a very draconian lockdown. And the government of India does not seem to have any response to the fact that numbers are not dipping. And we are already at number one in terms of daily infections. And if this rate continues, in another month or so, we are likely to take overtake the United States as the most infected uh, place in the world. Yes, so um, clearly, uh, the situation in the two most populous countries of the world could not be more divergent. Where in one case, the pandemic, if you like, began very early um, at the end of the last calendar year, not even in 2020. Um, and yet their total numbers in China are actually less than our, at least some of our recent daily numbers. Whereas the dramatically different trajectory that the pandemic took with us was that it started very much more slowly. One might almost say it started much later. It gained strong, enduring footholds in communities in India much, much later. And I suspect that part of the reason for that, please let us all keep in mind that much of this is guesswork of, uh, of trying to make sense of a chaotic situation. But that said, our um, draconian nationwide lockdown with a four hour notice um, implemented as a law and order policing problem uh, quite quite clearly from day one will have had the effect, as we have been saying since then, of delaying establishment and foothold for the for the infection. Simply because people in the early weeks stayed at home with the resultant uh, uh, economic breakdown, with the resultant non-COVID-19 public health breakdown, not simply treating illness, but also in providing support to pregnant women, for children's immunizations, in all of this. Because people stayed at home, we simply delayed the takeoff. But the takeoff was always going to happen because you're never going to stop the last possibility of infection. So the thing that we needed to have done, which we do not clearly seem to have done with, with any efficiency, is put in place a genuine, reliable, community participating, testing to scale, contact tracing to scale, and isolation in practicable, humane, well-supported fashion. We've never done this. Our response still continues to be a policing response. One of the major prominent pieces of COVID-19 pandemic related news in India over the past few days, for example, is that the police are collecting now X amounts of funds as fines from people who are not wearing masks. And the interesting thing there is, we're not discussing the failure of public outreach of information and true community participation 
in people not wearing masks. Instead, we are simply addressing how much money we've collected for, for non-wearing of masks. And this is emblematic of what we've been saying all these months, that a public health problem is being treated as a law and order problem. When, when that has been the consistent approach, it's no surprise that what we are going to have is simply, as I said, a delay in the establishment of, of the infection in the community because of the draconian lockdown, followed by an expansion of the pandemic. In the, of as, the, as the lockdown weakens, a continued rise of numbers. In any case, the lockdown had to break down. You need to give people food, which you were not giving. They had so, their poor migration. So All we've done this in the past, and since you bring it up, I, let's uh, underline it again. The timetable for the unlockdown has been driven by, in part, by the socio-economic inevitabilities that you point out. That there's only so long that people can sustain it in socio-economic terms, and by a political trajectory of management of public relations, if you will, rather than responding to actual ground level pandemic situation. It's also interesting that even now, it's a Ministry of Home that releases all the guidelines. Ministry of Health has disappeared from view. We don't even have the health minister come in on the television screens. And when the prime minister does come, he's seen with peacocks feeding them. But you know, or on Red Fort, but we don't really hear him talking about the Mahabharata war against COVID-19 we thought would be over in three weeks. But leaving that out, this is a political criticism of the public relations, leaving it out, what we don't see is any evaluation of what has happened and what we need to do now, except talking about, in a very opaque fashion, lockdown and unlockdown phases. And saying that now the central government is going to look after districts directly, minus the state governments even, bypassing the state government. Again, a completely uh, stop-down, centralized law and order approach to the problem. Of course, the emergency act that we have, and we are under a state of emergency because of the Disaster Management Act, which is in operation at the moment. Coming to a more specific issue, since you are in Pune, and Pune has emerged as the uh, probably the large, fastest growing numbers of any urban area at the moment. What explains this in Pune? So, um, as, as I have said uh, repeatedly all these months, there aren't necessarily rational explanations for every event in the chaotic landscape of, of, uh, uh, of, an, of an epidemic. That said, let's keep what I think of as the class dimension of the epidemic in mind. The epidemic was initiated by the extent of international travel in volume terms, meaning large volume of international travel exchange. This is not to blame one person bringing a disease or anything of the sort. This is simply to point out that infection as a statistical phenomenon would spread from country to country from one original uh, uh, source point with likelihoods that would correlate with the volume of air travel. And the volume of air travel is driven even today by and large by business considerations. So in a certain sense, it is the socio-economic class category of business travelers who are in a statistical sense the transmitters across international boundaries. But once you have the virus beginning to spread locally, the local spread depends on, on a completely different set of socioeconomic conditions. It depends on crowding and not just crowding as in the marketplace, 
but crowding over a full 24 hour period with housing very close to each other with crowding within houses with um, shared uh, toilet facilities with extraordinarily narrow lanes and so on and so forth now if you think about it in those terms then the largest labor concentration urban labor concentration which lives in india in the most crowded apartment colony conditions or tenement colony conditions um, what in uh, the mumbai pune sector would be called super patti which in delhi would be called the chuggi jhopri uh, residential conditions or uh, one step above we built crowded flats but with shared toilet facilities that are called uh, the chawls in the mumbai pune sector uh, which are essentially tenement housing Mum the mumbai pune urban conglomerate is the largest urban apartment and tenement colony uh, community in the country connected to the largest international transit point okay. of traffic which is mumbai the extent of crowding is much more in quantitative terms in a variety of parameters than in than in delhi so yes. for me it's not surprising that it's over this sector that steady relentless growth please keep in mind that the relentless growth is also a, a something of an artifact of our political definitions the virus is still popping up in different small neighborhoods and uh, dying down and popping up and dying down but it's all happening within this what i'm calling in extremely high density working class communities satyajit it's a very interesting point that you're making of course if you look at the map of maharashtra you will see that mumbai pune and thane in between of course are the worst affected and then you see the districts which are contiguous to this spreading either up or down from these areas so you get a sort of a ink stain with focus in mumbai focus in thane and focus in pune which are the urban concentrations and the general spread of this uh, ink blot equivalent infections so you do see this kind of shift that will, that is taking place in the country but what is worrying at the moment that the indian spread is now almost in all parts of the country maybe numbers are less maybe numbers are more but there is no area which is not affected by people who are already confirmed cases so almost all areas have confirmed cases and all of them have some core areas from which there of course the connections exist between the urban and rural areas and they are spreading so therefore unless we work out something which we have still not done if we wait for nature to do its part it's probably going to take years if ever so is vaccines the only answer that we will have in terms of the containment otherwise it's going to go on like this so this is this is a very this is a really distressing thing to have to say that we seem to be in a situation where our response as a state our response as a government or as governments is simply to continue from yesterday despite the fact that the empirical evidence on the ground is that what we were doing yesterday is not working is at the very least not adequate and yet there doesn't seem to be radical rethinking at least none of us have heard any radical rethinking about what policies and strategies might be thought of a fresh and new in this matter i think that is a very depressing situation for us to be in because what that says is that this is how we are going to go on 
we are going to go on with the top down um, policy in which district administrations are being threatened and blamed by government leadership, by political leadership, to ensure that your case numbers are low, to ensure that your deaths are low without an appropriate and adequate injection of resources, without an appropriate and adequate conceptualization of strategies and policies, all that this is going to do is um, politicize, uh, as, as a verb to uh, substitute for militarize, politicize the problem more and more and more, with the result that we are going to see growing resentment against government responses. We are going to see growing, growing resentment against what, are, what will increasingly be seen as distancing measures that apparently have no effect. We are going to see resentment against the inadequate, the manifestly inadequate provision of COVID-19 related uh, medical facilities. In Pune, there are stories in the, on the front pages of the newspapers about patients in dire need for oxygen and for um, intensive care facilities running from pillar to post to find admissions. We're going to see increasing resentment about this. What we are going to keep getting in response is more and more the government wielding a big stick, apparently ineffectually. And this is going to be a state of emergency that will continue and will be utilized um, almost perversely as an um, let me quote uh, our leadership as an act of God to rationalize a uh, failure uh, of the government on very broad fronts. To rationalize it's, its failures, and there are two other things they can, also, of course, do that if for the central government, blame the states and also externalize the issue. There, of course, is as you know, the Shushant Rajput case, which has become according to television, the most important national issue in the country. And uh, they have discovered that actually in the film industry, young people take marijuana and other drugs. Apparently, they were not aware of it. But this is something which was news to them. So this has become the major center of major talking point across the media. A huge failure of the media. You don't hear about the failure of the policies, the health policies, what's happening. All this is only coming up in numbers and only in response to what New York Times and others are writing. And uh, still the media is dominated by other news. And of course, you have the border. So, you know, the border news, nationalism, uh, I'm not going to go into that today. But these are good distractions because I doubt that India and China will be foolish enough to get into a border war. But nevertheless, it keeps the pot boiling. And it's also true that there is no hard questions being asked in general about the failure of the government. And let's say, see this, even Brazil, even the United States, their numbers are falling, India's numbers not. So that is, that's really something which should worry everybody. But I don't see this worry either in the government or in the uh, quote unquote informed circles, which is the first layer of this in the media. Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's interesting that you bring up the contrast between uh, the recent situation of the pandemic in the US and India. And the distinction seems to be on two major fronts. One, as you point out, there are sections of the media in the US, by no means uh, uh, all the media, but there are sections of the media in the US, which are doing systematic in-depth reporting. Um, and, and, and keeping the pandemic in the public eye. Uh, and that's sadly helped by the fact that the numbers in the US are, 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 are so dramatically more even now. But the second issue 
which again relates to governmental policies in response to the pandemic, is that there are in the federal structure of the US, there are state governments that have responded quite differently from the responses of the federal government to local control of the pandemic, to uh, outreach for distancing measures, participation in distancing measures, to test provision, to contact tracing, to all sorts of situations. They are not huge differences. But those small differences, I think, accumulate into the current differences between the two countries. We do not seem to have, as yet, with an occasional exception such as um, uh, Kerala's models, um, that dramatic a separation between the response of the union government and the response of state governments, in part, of course, driven by uh, top-down approaches all around. Yes, I think that's where you also bring out the fact that the media, at least in the United States, has turned the light onto the failures of the government. And in our case, that media has played a very, very quote unquote reporting role, but not an investigation, is an investigative or a critical role that it is also supposed to play and particularly give space to those voices. There are there public health experts who are questioning all of that, but their voices are really not percolating. And what seems to come is things which are avoided deaths, our death numbers are actually lower compared to the number of infections, etc., etc., which we can discuss another day. But essentially alibis of some kind or the other. Thank you, Satyajit, for being with us as you have been for quite some time now. And we'll come back to you next time, probably with looking at the vaccine issue again. Because as we have said here, the only long term solution that lies now for India, more than even for other countries, is the vaccine without which we don't seem to be able to come out of the crisis we are in. This is all the time we have for NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and do visit our website.